Good morning. Good morning. It is a great morning to be here. Fall is upon us and the weather is changing, but the fellowship is not. Uh, it is go so good to see so many here this morning. Uh, if you're our guest this morning, you're our honored guest. We're thankful for you uh, being here to worship. Uh, we look forward to uh, getting to know you better and spending some time with you. Um, got a few announcements to go over this morning. Uh, we'll start with the prayer request and some that need encouragement. Uh, Ms. Faye Chapman is going to have uh, some thyroid surgery October 18th, uh, so please keep Faye uh, in your prayers. And then Ellen Hoffman uh, has got her, uh, her brace off and a good report uh, uh, on her checkup, and it looks like she is cleared for the next six weeks before she has to go back over to the Metroplex. Um, I see Tannis is here with us this morning with her wing all strapped to her side, and so doing well. Um, um, and Liz is home. If you weren't aware, Liz Robertson had been to the hospital. Liz is here? Yeah. Excellent. Well, Liz is here with us this morning. So, Amen. Amen. Very good to, and glad that y'all are here with us and, and doing better. Um, if you would, keep Judy Hathcox in your prayers. She's traveled over to Dallas to continue some of her cancer treatments, and so she's making her way there and back. And then... Uh, uh, Peggy Sue is the mother of Jeremy uh, Sumner. Uh, Kayla's husband passed away, so if you see Jeremy or Kayla, uh, offer them some encouragement and some love. Um, let's see here. All right, moving on to the things that are happening. There's always seems like we got a lot happening and a lot of opportunities to serve or encourage or to fellowship. Uh, but tonight, uh, as far as fellowship, our 50 and holding bunch will meet in the fellowship hall and play games. And then I think most of the other stuff is out towards the end of October. I'll just leave that for you to look in your announcement sheet um, and pick up those details. Uh, one reminder that's not in the announcement sheet, but starting next Sunday, we're going to go back, uh, I liked how Terry put it, normal, uh, but we're going to have our trays. So we have been doing the baggies uh, with the communion, and we'll continue to have those back there, but we will begin passing the trays again uh, on Sunday, so just be aware there'll be uh, a little bit there. I think that is all the announcements I have, unless there's anything else that needs to be mentioned this morning. Okay, our uh, our website there's a directory there. Uh, it's down right now. We're getting that corrected. So if you make use of that, trying to get addresses or phone numbers for uh, any of the members. And if you're not aware uh, that you have access to that, uh, catch Will, he can get you details, uh, or Amber, and uh, we'll help you make use of that resource as we try to stay connected uh, with one another. Anything else this morning? Very good, let's go to worship. This one just came in. This is from Susan, uh, from Faye Chapman's daughter, Susan. Um, and she says that, uh, I'll just read it. Hi, this is Faye Chapman's daughter, Susan. Our youngest sister, Candace Chapman, passed away last night from a blood clot in her lungs. She lived in Tampa, Florida, and it just left. I bumped it. So this is Faye Chapman's youngest daughter, uh, passed away last night, and uh, so that's two daughters very since March that have passed away, and uh, she is also dealing with thyroid surgery coming up, so we need to remember Faye Chapman. That's kind of quick, but uh, we'll get the details out and uh, remember Faye Chapman. In Acts chapter 6, we have a little bit of fuss goes on about uh, some of the widows being overlooked, but that's, that's not my point right now. But to solve it, what the apostles do, they come along and they ask the church to choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom, and we will turn this responsibility over to them, and we'll give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. I was thought that these men are the first deacons to serve in the body of Christ. And that's a position that we still use today, that when we know there are tasks that need to be done, 
that need to be accomplished that we will appoint men to, to make sure those things are done. And so this morning, we have two men, and if we have Gabriel and Marta come up, and David and Holly, can we... We have a couple tasks where we have asked these men to focus on them and help make sure that what needs to be done uh, is taken care of. And so to help take care of our missionaries and the mission programs, uh, Gabriel Rodriguez has agreed to help coordinate that, which is beneficial because uh, a good number of our missionaries are Spanish speaking and that is right in his abilities as well, much less his ability to take care of things. And to help take care of things that go on in the sound booth and things around the building, uh, David Pearson has agreed to take on that task for so well. So we, we want to thank them for agreeing to do this for us and help make sure these things are, are done. And that uh, if you have any questions or would you like to help with anything in these areas, these are the gentlemen to see in that. Are you leading our opening prayer? Oh, Irvin, Didn't, were you leading the opening prayer when we had the elders? You are a master of timing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, would you mind to go ahead and lead us in prayer at this moment for, for these gentlemen and, and, uh, and our deacons uh, to include that in, in your prayer? Uh, but uh, I'd encourage you all to uh, thank, thank these folks to, for uh, stepping in and, and serving on our behalf to make sure these things go on. Are you gonna? Did I mess up y'all's? Okay. Pray with me, please. Our Father in heaven, we pause this morning to thank you for so many things, but certainly to thank you for these two fine men who have stepped forward to serve as deacons in your church. Father, we love them, we know them, we trust them, and we pray, Lord, that you will be with them, and we know you will be. But we pray that uh, we can all be of service in helping them get started and to help them serve and to enjoy that. We pray also for their wives because it is a team effort. We pray, Lord, that they can work together as a team that uh, good things will happen, that our congregation will move forward and be better because of these people, and we know it. We thank you for giving them to us. And we continue, Lord, also, and thank you for all things that come from you. We realize all good things are blessings. And we pray, Lord, that, that you would just uh, continue to bless us. We appreciate it. We thank you for it. Life is good, and we want to always realize that it is good because you make it good. We pray, God, for this country. We pray, Lord, for the world and for countries throughout the world that leaders could somehow use some good common sense and make decisions that are good for people and that's good for you also. We pray, Lord, that uh, as the election comes forward that we can somehow separate those good from bad and help us to all go to the polls and voice our opinions, give our vote, but help us, Lord, to make this country strong and keep it strong. But we thank you for this country. Thank you for our families. Thank you for this church family. Thank you for good health. And we pray, Lord, that, that you be with those who are ill and with their families and for those who have lost loved ones and with those families. We pray, God, that our life would be good, would be long. And when it's over, we pray that you'll take us home. In Christ's name, amen. Number 140, Love Divine. <clears throat> love divine, all love excelling, joy of heaven to earth come down. Fix in us thy humble dwelling, all thy faithful mercies crown. Jesus, thou art all compassion, pure unbounded love thou art. 
Visit us with thy salvation. Enter every trembling heart. Breathe, O oh, breathe thy loving spirit into every troubled breast. Let us all in thee inherit. Let us find the promised rest. Take away the love of sinning. Take our load of guilt away. In the work of thy beginning, bring us to eternal day. Finish then thy new creation, pure, unspotted may we be. Let us see our whole salvation, perfectly secured by thee, changed from glory into glory, till in heaven we take our place, till we cast our crowns before thee, lost in wonder, love, and praise. <clears throat> Faith is the victory, number 469. Encamped along the hills of light, ye Christian soldiers rise and press the battle ere the night shall veil the glowing skies. Against the foe in veils below, let all our strength be hurled. Faith is the victory we know that overcomes the world. Faith is the victory. Faith is the victory, oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. His banner over us is love, our sword, the word of God. We tread the road, the saints above, with shouts of triumph trod. By faith they, like a whirlwind's breath, swept on o'er every field. The faith by which they conquer death is still our shining shield. Faith is the victory, faith is the victory, oh glorious victory that overcomes the world. To him that overcomes the foe, white raiment shall be given. Before the angels he shall know his name confessed in heaven. Then onward from the hills of light, our hearts with love aflame, will vanquish all the host of night in Jesus' conquering name. Faith is the victory, faith is the victory, Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. <clears throat> Number 539, Higher Ground. <clears throat> I'm pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day. Still praying as I onward bound. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand. By faith on heaven's table land. A higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. My heart has no desire to stay where doubts arise and fierce dismay. Though some may dwell where these abound, my prayer, my aim is higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table land. A higher plane than I have found. 
Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. I want to live above the world, though Satan's darts at me are hurled. For faith has caught the joyful sound, the song of saints on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table land, a higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. I want to scale the utmost height and catch a gleam of glory bright, but still I'll pray till heaven I found. Lord, lead me on to higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table land, a higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. <clears throat> to uh, help prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper this morning, number 335, in memory of the Savior's love. <clears throat> in memory of the Savior's love, we keep the sacred feast where every humble contrite heart is made a welcome guest. By faith we take the bread of life with which our souls are fed. The cup and token of his blood that was for sinners shed. Beneath his banner, thus we sing the wonders of his love. And here anticipate by faith the heavenly feast above. As Wes mentioned uh, last time, hopefully, did anybody not pick up one of these? We got somebody in the back that will bring you one if you raise your hand. Got some over here. Anybody else? Make one comment before we start in this part of the worship is uh, for you men, if you haven't, know, let us know that you're willing to serve on the table. We'd greatly appreciate you letting us know. We're running kind of short of men nowadays. So we're gonna need six guys up here every Sunday morning. And, uh, and still one person up here to say the prayers. So if you're willing to, to serve, please let one of the elders or Irvin know so we can get you on the list, and we appreciate that. We're gathered around the table this morning as a family of God, brothers and sisters of Christ to remember and honor Jesus. And I'd like to start that by reading from 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning in... Uh, Verse 21, Christ suffered for you. He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness by his wounds. You have been healed. Let's pray. Father, we humbly approach your throne at this time to remember and honor Jesus as we think back upon his life. We're so thankful that he lowered himself beneath the angels to live as a human, 
so that he may live as we do, to be tormented as we do, to go through the pains and sacrifice that we do, all so that he could ultimately be lifted upon that cross and die for us. We know that he bore our sins, and we're so thankful for this. As we partake of this bread that represents his body that was nailed upon that cross, we pray that you'll bless it and that we'll help take it into our hearts and remember Jesus to always look up, to always keep our focus on Jesus, and to remember and to look at our own lives and decide do we have that, do we still have the relationship with Jesus? Do we still struggle to be Christ like? Are we following in his footsteps? We pray that as we evaluate ourselves and look over these things and remember all that Jesus went through for us, we pray that you'll bless us. These things we ask in Christ's name. Amen. You'll pray with me again. Father, we continue our prayer of remembrance and honor of Jesus as we think upon those things that he went through for us, that he died upon that cross for us, shedding his blood so that we have forgiveness of sins. And as we prepare to partake of this fruit of the vine that represents his blood that was shed upon that cross for us, we pray that we'll remember him and look toward him and always keep him deep in our hearts. We also want to remember all that he does now at your right hand. We know that he's over everything. And if we look intently to him and pray to you through him, that our prayers will be answered. We, may we keep the faith that he instilled in us. May we always keep it there and always move forward. All these things we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Apart from the Lord's Supper, we've always taken the opportunity to give back to God. It's not something we're forced to do. It's something we want to do. Reading in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6, Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each man should give what is decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly, are under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver, and God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Pray with me. Father, at this time, we want to remember you, all the blessings that we have through you. We're so thankful for not only the spiritual blessings, but the physical blessings we have. And we know that as we give back to, to you, that all, all the monies will go to works here in the congregation and abroad in the mission work, to children's homes, and to other work to further your name. It'll all be done for your glory. And we pray that you'll continue to bless all these programs. We pray that you'll be with the congregation as they frequently and consciously give back to you a portion of, your first, of their first fruits that they've gained from you. And I ask that you, you give the elders the wisdom and the understanding to, as to set the budget to make those decisions, that those hard decisions often that come with allocating the money. We know there are so many good works out there that we can't financially support. 
but we pray that you'll give us the wisdom to grant to support those that will bring the most value to your name all these things we ask in christ's name amen Living by Faith, number 560. If it's convenient, let's stand as we sing this song, please. <clears throat> I care not today what the morrow may bring, if shadow or sunshine or rain. The Lord I know ruleth o'er everything, and all of my worry is vain. Living by faith, in Jesus above, trusting, confiding in his great love. From our home safe, in his sheltering arm, I'm living by faith and feel no alarm. Though tempests may blow and the storm clouds arise, Obscuring the brightness of life. I'm never alarmed at the overcast skies. The master looks on at the strife. Living by faith in Jesus above. Trusting, confiding in his great love. From our home safe. In his sheltering arm, I'm living by faith and feel no alarm. Our Lord will return to this earth some sweet day. Our troubles will then all be o'er. The Master so gently will lead us away beyond that blessed heavenly shore. Living by faith, in Jesus above, trusting, confiding in his great love. From our home safe in his sheltering arm, I'm living by faith and feel no alarm. Be seated, please. Scripture reading this morning will be coming from 1 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 12. You know, brothers, brothers and sisters, to our visit to you was not without result. We had previously suffered and been treated outrageously in Philippia, as you know. But with the help of our God, we dared to tell you his gospel in the face of strong opposition. For the appeal we make does not spring from error or impure motives, nor are we trying to trick you. On the contrary, we speak as those approved by God to entrusted with the gospel. We are not trying to please people but God who tests our hearts. You know we never used flattery, nor did we put on mask cover up green. God is our witness. We are not looking to praise from people not from you or anyone else, even though as apostles of Christ we could have assorted our authority. Instead, we were like young children among you. Just as nursing mothers care for her children, so we care for you, because we love you so much. We are delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. Surely you remember, brothers and sisters, our toil and hardship. We work night and day in order not to be a burden to anyone while we preach the gospel of God to you. You are witnessing witnesses, and so is God. And how holy, righteousness, and blameless we are among you who believe. You know we dealt with each of you as the Father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God who calls you into the kingdom of glory. Morning. Morning. 
It's going to be odd passing trays next week, isn't it? It's going to feel different because how long have we been doing it otherwise? It's over two years. But uh, I'm sure we'll get back in the routine pretty quick. I, I managed, well, I managed to spill the juice on me this morning for the first time in all these two years. So I'm looking forward to maybe being able to control myself better without having to peel something off. Before we get into our lesson this morning, let's have our prayer together and then we'll start our study. Our Father and our God, we, we are so very grateful. It is overwhelming at times, Father, when we realize all that you've done for us, how you've taken care of us, how you've provided for so much in our lives, for our souls. And Father, we, we at so many times struggle struggle with temptations we struggle with our ability to trust you completely but father we want to trust you with our whole lives we know that you are faithful we know that you keep your promises we ask father that you'll help us to rest in your promises to be filled with hope as we look forward to the fulfillment of everyone. <clears throat> but help us, Father, to live today knowing who you are and what you've done for us through your Son. We thank you, Father, for that. For through Jesus we pray. Amen. <clears throat> My goodness, excuse me. Getting all choked up. Oh, there we are. You know, there are some advantages to having older siblings or older cousins. I, I didn't have either. Well, I did have an older cousin, but you'll see in a minute why this, that didn't really have an impact on what went on in my life. Uh, one of the advantages of having older siblings and older cousins are hand-me-downs. I would ask who's wearing hand-me-downs this morning, but some of the kids may not want to volunteer that information right off. But when you get hand-me-downs, you know, you can kind of anticipate. I mean, how many, how many of y'all went into the closets of your older siblings and chose out clothes that you wanted to wear that they had? Hand-me-downs. Now, you, you may or may not have done that, but the thing about that is there's some positives to it. The, the negative side of having older siblings it's hand-me-downs because all of a sudden you're stuck with clothes that you would not have chosen for yourself but because your older sibling had them and they're still in good shape you have to wear them because your parents have put them in your closet so you you look at that idea of, of there's some good and bad to it in life how many things do we have that in a sense are hand-me-downs how many things in our lives do we do because we've been given and gifted those by others before us. Think for a moment. Why do you believe what you believe? Why do you believe what you believe today? And when we think about that, there are all kinds of different ways that we might explain why we believe what we believe. There are a lot of things we believe because of what we've understood, what we've studied, what we've learned, and our experiences in life. We've got, this is what brought me here, was because I learned this and I grew in this, and we have that faith in, because of that. But, uh, but for a lot of us, and pretty much all of us, I would bet, we would also talk about how there are people in our lives that had an impact on us and helped us learn what faith was, helped us to learn what belief was all about, and we, we in a sense, gain from their influence. We gain from them, and we, we have that faith in our lives because of them. And so we, we know because of this person, 
because of my grandparents, because of my parents, because of an older sibling, because of a cousin, because of a neighbor, because of a teacher, because of somebody in my life. We all might have a story where there was somebody in our lives that had an impact on, on us and our faith and helped us get where we are today and had a hand in that. And when, when you look at that, that idea of what got us where we are, that faith that we have, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, Paul, in talking about the, the Christians there, told, talked about how their reception, to how his preaching and their teaching and all that went on. And he says, the Lord's message rang out for you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, your faith in God has become known everywhere. See, do you hear that? Talking about what they believe. It says, people know what you believe. Therefore, we do not need to say anything about it, for they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. They tell how you turned to God from the idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus who rescued, rescued us from the coming wrath. You can hear their faith as he describes that. What they believe. He says, well, I know where you were, but I know where you are now, and that response that you had to the message that we preached resulted in your faith. I, I think, in a sense, a question for all of us is about our faith. We know that every one of us has something that we believe, but there is a distinction that we, we need to make today about our faith. Is the faith that you have yours, or are you living by somebody else's faith? And I, it's natural. It's just part of life that we know children tend to believe what their parents believe. As they grow up, and when they first start out, they'll talk about things based upon what their parents do. All of us have done that. Every one of us, as we were growing up, we learned what life was all about. And the first influence we had in our life, that, that was our parents. And because of that, we, we tended to, to echo what we learned from them. And it was part of it. In fact, if you ask any of the little ones today, and they'll, they'll talk about, this is our church. This is my church. They take ownership of it because they're here. And I, I wouldn't dissuade them from that at all because that's part of learning and growing up. But as we get older, there's a point where there's a transition that, that should be made, that has to be made, where we have to decide what we believe for ourselves and our own faith. And if we're not careful, if we haven't made that transition, we, we have a faith that belongs to somebody else. And the problem with that is that it hasn't been challenged yet. And it hasn't been... Oh, it hasn't been part of our life to where we've chosen it for ourselves as opposed to we have to. If we're trying to live by somebody else's faith, it's something we feel like we have to. We don't get a choice as opposed to something that we chose for ourselves. And, and there's, there, it's really important for us to learn to have our own faith. In, in Luke chapter 8, Jesus tells a parable about a sower who goes out into the field and he scatters his seed. Some of it falls on the path. Uh, and it's trampled on, the birds ate it up, some fell on rocky ground and when it came up, uh, the plants withered because they had no moisture, other seed fell among the thorns, which grew up with it and choked the plants, other seed fell on good soil, and it came up and yielded a crop a hundred times more than what was sown. And when he, when he gives this parable, he says What's this, what this is about is the word of God and how it has an impact on our hearts. And for us to have faith, eventually we've got to decide what we're going to do in response to the Word of God and what goes on. And then when we have our own faith, that means we're able to have a faith that grows and flourishes on its own for every one of us. And so that idea of having our own faith really does matter because it's something that, that is going to determine what goes on within our own hearts. When I live by somebody else's faith, it's not, it's not something that's changing my heart. It's something that I'm just going by because that's what I've always done. Now, faith, this is the definition I want us to, to, to go by this morning. Faith is faith when it's freely chosen. Faith is faith when it's freely chosen. And for all of us, when we talk about our faith... If it's going to be my faith, it's something that I've chosen for myself. If it's not my faith, I haven't chosen it. And it's not really faith yet. It's a form, but it's not the substance that needs to be. In Joshua chapter 24, whenever Joshua talks to the people of Israel and tells them, says, you know, look, you've got to make a choice. And so he tells them, fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your ancestors worshipped beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt. I, 
You know how many times that phrase has been used? And I keep thinking, why are they still gathering up idols? But that's just, that's another topic. He says, throw away the idols, serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. You hear the choice that he gives them. The choice that he makes. And for us to have faith that, that is strong and is flourishing and thrives means that we have chosen to live by faith. We've chosen our own faith. And for us to have that means we, we make that choice. Now, that, that idea of, of choosing it is, is something we have to keep in mind, that this is what God has always done. Choose who you're going to serve. This isn't something that's forced on you. It's something that you choose. Now, the, the challenge in that, the challenge in that, is that there are, there are many of us, especially who are parents, grandparents, and may just be aunts, uncles, somebody who has uh, younger folks in our lives, and we agonize about whether or not they will choose to serve God. And have you all ever had, had that? Where you worry about your children? You worry about your grandchildren and how they live their lives? And whether or not they'll serve God and, and, and put their faith in him? I know that many of us have. And when we, when we have that, that desire, that fear, that they'll choose differently, it'll push us sometimes to do things to try to get them to believe, to try to get them to where they will serve God. And so we'll push hard. Because we want so much for them to make that right choice. And we'll push because we want them to live for God. We want them to trust God. We want them to put their faith in God. And, and our, our hearts ache when, they, when we see that they haven't. And we'll, we'll try to find some, some choice. Some, we'll try to get some influence in there. And so we're so eager we're so eager to get them to, to believe that we'll do whatever it takes to where we're trying to choose for them. And because in that eagerness to get them to believe, sometimes people have used coercion and manipulation, and it, and it results in harm. Now, when you think about that, we gotta, because the def, what we're looking at is faith is faith when it's freely chosen. If I force you to say the right words, is it really faith? If I try to get you to believe in Christ and you're not choosing, is it really faith? And what I want us to, to wrestle with is the idea of, you know, how do we muck up that faith development? You know, uh, Paul in our scripture reading says, you know, when we made our appeal to you, he says, we did, it didn't come from error or impure motives. And we weren't trying to trick you. On the contrary, we speak as those approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We're not trying to please people, but God who tests our hearts. You know we never used flattery, nor did we put on a mask to cover up greed. God is our witness. We are not looking for, for praise from people, nor from you or anyone else, even though as apostles of Christ, we could have asserted our authority. He says we could have said you have to, but he says we wanted you to choose. We didn't want to do anything to get you to feel like you were forced into it, that you had the opportunity to choose. And so when we have that idea of when we, when we talk about developing a faith, if I said, if I said, now the title is, is cultish, uh, and I found out there's a book and a TV show and all kinds of things with that same title, but it's the idea, if I ever came up to you and said, hey, I found out how cults get people to believe things that are outlandish, maybe we could use that for God. Does that sound like a good idea? To use what cults use to try to get us to believe in Christ? But you know what cults do? You, we look at that and say, there's no way I would believe that. But the reality is what happens is that cults use, they use tactics that, that don't develop faith. They, they cause folks to, to make choices under duress, to use coercive persuasion, unethical persuasion. And so you use fear. 
Something made cho chosen out of fear sometimes is not a choice that we would make, but we feel like we've been forced into it. When we talk about emotional manipulation, as opposed to just choosing it, we, we, that cults will use manipulation to try to get people to make those choices. Uh, obligation. Do you know the reason? Now, they don't do it anymore, do they? But you all remember the older folks among us. Do you all remember going to the airport and having the folks in the nice, pretty robes wanting to sell you a flower or give you a flower? you all remember that? Do you know why they w wanted to give you that? Because if you accept a gift from somebody, we feel an obligation to do something back for them. And so if they give you a flower, what they were hoping is you'd get a donation back. And that sense of obligation is sometimes, in a sense, we were here for you, now we want you to be here for us, is something that, that can be used to get people to do things they wouldn't have chosen on their own. The idea of, of control and unhealthy guilt. Now, there's a difference between healthy guilt and unhealthy guilt. But to manipulate people in their thinking and what's going on and trying to guarantee sometimes we're tempted. We want somebody to have faith and we'll use whatever, whatever it takes to get them to develop faith as opposed to thinking about it from the perspective of what God wants to have happen. And, that, and this happens biblically. Look, look in uh, John chapter 9. We've got the fellow who was born blind from birth. Jesus heals him. And the, the leaders are going, how'd this happen? Because they don't want to admit that Jesus could heal anybody. They call his parents in. Is this your son? Was he born blind? I said, well, we know he was born blind, but how he sees, I, we don't know. But it says, uh, <clears throat> how can he, uh, they said, ask him, he is of age, he will speak for himself. And they said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders who already had decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. Now think about that phrase right there, because out of fear they would not say anything, even if they thought it was true that Jesus was the Messiah, they wouldn't say anything about it because of fear. Now the, they know it's true because their son gets, gets kicked out of the synagogue just later on in this chapter, because he starts telling them, so I believe, and they say, you're going to lecture us? In chapter, 11, in chapter 12, it says many of the leaders believed in Jesus because of the Pharisees they would not openly acknowledge their faith for fear they would be put out of the synagogue for they loved human praise more than praise from God. Now there's a double thing going on. It's a fear keeping them from believing what's true and, and that idea of, of the accolades that would come from others. Now when you watch this process whenever fear was used it kept them from, a, from having faith. It kept them from doing and choosing what, what would be right. And the challenge in all that, in, whenever you have things go on, is that whenever somebody chooses out of, out of pressure, it feels good to us. <laughs> Y'all re remember, uh, you know, how many verses does Just As I Am have? Y'all remember? W when, way back when we were having gospel meetings regularly, how many verses would Just As I Am have? Still six? No, no, you got to repeat them. And then somewhere in the break, the preacher would get back up and say, okay, if nobody's come up, give another little talk and we'd start over again. I'm convinced that we had some responses during those years because somebody said, somebody's got to go up there and get this to stop. Now, did they really respond because they felt they needed to respond or was it because they felt like I got to do something. You know, how many times? How many times have we had? Now, this, uh, y'all may, may have memories. How many times did, can we get, we'll have some teens come up, and all of a sudden you have more and more teens come up because of the emotion of the moment at a youth rally? I've watched that happen. And we look at that, and it feels good because when you get responses, when you get people come up, when you get people put on Christ and baptism, we get excited. Look at well, look what's going on because it looks like that they, they have really chosen well. And I, and I wonder if we don't use, if we use coercion, we, we've missed what God would want to have developed. How many, how many of those folks that came, came up out of desperation of let's get this over really have faith now? How many of those teenagers that came up on youth rallies have faith now? Do we help them develop faith? But if we have all the right numbers, it, sometimes it feels good to us. 
And what we don't put into the equation is the harm that's done. How, how many of us know people, I know people, how many, know, how many of us know people that don't want to have anything to do with any kind of church because of what was done to them when they were younger? The pressure they felt and the pushing they felt. And we don't count those numbers in our, in our talk we, but we for, because we forget about them. We don't want to count them. But the reality is, if, when we use manipulation, when we use coercion, like, like cults might do, what we end up doing is we don't help somebody to develop faith. They, later on, if it's not their faith, what they have feels empty later on, that they struggle. And they feel like, well, I've, I've done all the right things. I was baptized. I've, I believe I've gone to church, but then their faith is empty because it wasn't their faith. They feel burden of uh, shame and guilt because of all their struggles, and it didn't feel like it's really working. And it's not their faith. We get fixated on, on things. Uh, you know, the thing about baptism, I, I love Acts chapter 19. The thing about baptism, it's easy to count somebody who's been in the baptistry. But is it is possible for somebody to be baptized and it not really be what God wants? I know... Uh, you know, all the teenagers I worked with in Big Spring are all grown-ups now, and some of them are even grandparents. I know some were baptized because they felt like everybody else was. And then later on, got to thinking about, did I do that because I, I thought I ought to? Or did I do that because of what was going on? In, in Acts 19, Paul comes up to some uh, disciples, and they say, he, he's trying to figure out who they are. It says, do you, did you get the Holy Spirit? And they go, who? He said, well, what baptism did you get? He said, John's. He said, John's was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, in Jesus. And on hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. The difference in the baptism was where was their faith? To believe in the one that was to come in Jesus. And what makes baptism worthwhile at all is faith. And baptism without faith isn't baptism. And so what we're, we need to, to keep in mind is no matter what goes on our, in our desires for people to develop, to, to respond to God, to respond to the gospel, is that our, our goal is for them to have faith, to have their own faith. For every one of our children that are here, that grew up here, when they, when they grow up and move off, whether they go to college or they start working or they spend the rest of their their lives here in Andrews, Texas, getting to enjoy all the benefits of being here. No matter where they are, we want them to have their own faith so that if they move off to some foreign land like Oklahoma, that when they're there, they have a faith of their own. And they choose to be faithful to God because it's their faith. That when our children grow and have their own children, that they have their own faith, that in the ups and downs of life that they're trusting God because they have chosen to trust God. And it, it's the same for all of us, isn't it? I want you to have your own faith so that when life is hard, because it does get hard, and if you haven't had the difficulties yet, I'll find you some folks with some difficulties, but if you don't have your own faith, it gets so much more difficult to find something to hold on to, to know that it's going to be, we're going to get through this because God is faithful to his promises. That our goal is for everybody to have their own faith. And so when we talk about faith, it means something different is going to go on. We Watch in Acts. In Acts. Now, I just picked a couple of the chapters out of the middle. In Acts chapter 17, we find Paul going to the synagogue, uh, uh, and he reasoned with them from the scriptures and explaining and proving that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus I'm proclaiming to you is the Messiah. He reasoned with them. And in 11 to 12, the Berean Jews were a more, a more noble character. He thought that was Thessalonica first. And they, rece they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. Do you hear their faith developing? It wasn't they, that Paul said, we're believing we want to do it. It's like, 
Paul said it, and they went into the Bible, and they go, is this true? And they developed their faith because they explored it their, themselves. In uh, Acts 18, every Sabbath, Paul reasoned in the synagogue, trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. He reasoned with them in the synagogue. Priscilla and Aquila, here's Apollos, who, who only knows the, the baptism of John, and they invited him to their home and explained to him the way of God more adequately. They, they talked with him so that he'd have a faith in what is. Over and over again, what we see is folks having faith because of the reasoning of that they got to choose, not because they were manipulated into it, but that they were presented. Say, this is who we're talking about. Let me tell you about Jesus and what he's done and what can be that God's promises for every one of us. And if you trust what God has said, let me tell you what to be. And they chose. They chose to follow Christ. And in that faith, it made a difference. And for us to help each other to develop that kind of faith means we teach with gentleness and respect. Gentleness and respect comes out of 1 Peter chapter 3. Because there it says, if you have faith and you want somebody else to be able to develop that faith, be ready to give an answer to, for the reason, for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. And so when you, when you look at that, we have to re remember that in our faith, for it to develop, it's a conversation, not trying to pressure. Because I want... We want every person, we want everybody growing up here, we want every adult, we want everybody we interact with to be able to say, yes, this is what I choose. This is what I believe. And I think sometimes what we worry about is whether or not the truth of God can really have an impact on people. So we want to do more. Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. God's truth, the message of Christ, is able to develop faith in us. When we listen, when we, when we wrestle with it, we're able to choose for ourselves, this is what I believe. It can make a difference in us. To God, our creator, the one who made all things, sent his son into this world to live, to die on the cross, to be buried and be raised from the dead so that we could come back home. Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 says, All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The appeal, the employee said, oh, here is our hope in Christ Jesus. And every one of us makes our own response, chooses our own response to that message. Will we believe what God has promised? Will we put our trust in him? In a sense, maybe we can look at it this way. In a sense, can you force somebody to love you? you they can treat you nice because they're afraid of what you might do, but they're not really loving you if you force them. Love is chosen, isn't it? And our trust in God, our faith in God is what we choose, whether or not we're going to believe that God is faithful to his promises. Where we say, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God, the Messiah. I believe that God has made these promises and that these are true. And I'm willing to put my life in his hands and live for him. I believe that God forgives us. Through Jesus Christ. I believe that when, when we, bury, we are buried in baptism with Christ, we come out of that, that water your grave, brand new, a brand new life. I believe that God keeps his promise in that. I believe. And when we're able to say for ourselves, I believe, that makes a world of difference. So no matter where you've come from, Here we are today. And, and the question 
is for each of us to answer, do you believe? Do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God? Do you believe that God is faithful to his promises? Now, maybe you are at a place right now where you need to, to learn more to be able to say, that's what I believe, yes. And that's why we're here. To be able to tell each other, remind each other, and encourage each other, say, here, let me tell you about what God has done. Let me tell you why I know he is faithful. Let me tell you about his promises. And you can you can choose. You you choose. And it may be today you have that faith that you've chosen. I believe that God is. I believe that God is faithful. I believe that he keeps his promises and you're ready to put on Christ in baptism. You can choose that. And we're here. And this morning we, we can do that today and, and celebrate with you. But it's your choice whether or not you'll trust God's promises in all things. And maybe as a child of God, you've forgotten. you struggled. God's blessed us with each other. To walk with each other and encourage each other. If you need in any way, if you, today you want to choose to respond to what God has said, you can come forward and make that known here. You can, you can find any of our elders in the back, anywhere around, and say, this is what you need. This is what you want to do. But if you need to respond, would you come now as we stand and sing? Just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know the saith the Lord. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I've proved him o'er and o'er. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, Oh, for grace to trust him more. Oh, how sweet to trust in Jesus, just to trust his cleansing blood, just in simple faith to plunge me neath the healing cleansing flood. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I proved him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. I'm so glad I learned to trust thee. Precious Jesus, Savior, friend, and I know that thou art with me, wilt be with me to the end. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I proved him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Closing song this morning will be number 709, How Sweet, How Heavenly. How sweet, how heavenly is the sight when those that love the Lord in one another's peace delight and so fulfill the word. When each can feel his brother's sigh and with him bear a part, when sorrow flows from eye to eye and joy from heart to heart. When
when free from envy, scorn, and pride, our wishes all above. Each can his brother's failings hide and show a brother's love. When love in one delightful stream through every bosom flows, when union sweet and dear esteem in every action glows. Love is the golden chain that binds the happy souls above, and he's an heir of heaven who finds his bosom glow with love. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for this day and allow us to come together in a public way to worship you. We're so thankful for the great number of people that are here this morning and to join uh, with us as we worship. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for our great teachers that we have here. We thank you for our young people and the good lessons that they're learning. We're so thankful and so appreciative of uh, the younger members of our congregation. And we ask you to bless them and, and constantly watch over them. Heavenly Father, we'd ask you to be with our members here that have been mentioned that uh, need some extra help. We ask you to bless uh, Faye Chapman and the loss of two daughters and then also her upcoming uh, thyroid surgery. We ask you to, to bless her and give her comfort and help that surgery to be a very successful surgery. Also be with Ellen Hoffman and Tennis Re uh, Renard as they recuperate from their uh, procedures. So thankful to have Liz Robertson and bless her as she grows stronger and stronger each day. And also with the family of Jeremy Sumners, whose um, uh, mother has passed away, we better bless that family and give them comfort. Heavenly Father, thank you for the country we live in. We ask for a more peaceful uh, country. Uh, again, leaders that can uh, unite uh, our, co our people. Uh, better than what's happening. Uh, we're so thankful for, again, the, the good uh, law enforcement people that we have, and we ask you to bless them and, and keep them safe. Heavenly Father, also, we want to continue asking for uh, the end to the, uh, the war in Ukraine. We ask you to bless those Christians that are uh, in the suffering, also just the people of Ukraine, and help that uh, war to come to an end quickly, if it be your will. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. We ask you, Heavenly Father, to uh, help us aware, be aware of those opportunities that you do give us uh, each day to do good in your name and help us to act on those opportunities. Uh, Heavenly Father, also help us to be the kind of people that can make those opportunities uh, arise and, and also to encourage others to grow stronger. We ask you to be with us, Heavenly Father, as each one of us has our own uh, particular uh, strength in our faith. We ask you to help us, our faith, to grow stronger and stronger each day and help us to make an a, a effort to do that. Uh, Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for your word that helps us along that way and the Holy Spirit uh, you give to uh, work in our lives. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for all that you do for us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. <laughs> 